A little boy was in school and he was drawing a picture. A teacher came up to him and said, what are you drawing? He said, well, I'm drawing a picture of God. Teacher said, don't you know nobody knows what God looks like? He said, they will when I get finished. Uh, today we're going to continue in our sermon series on Matthew. Uh, actually, Advent Sunday has begun, but we're kind of in one of those in-between Sundays. Next week, the regular pastors that teach will be back, and they're going to start with the Isaiah 9 passage. You saw it on the bumper right there. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace through the Sundays of December. And I hope you'll be back for every single one of those. Uh, today we're going to finish up Matthew chapter 20 looking at verses 29 through 34. So if you want to grab your Bibles, open it up, Matthew 20, get out your outlines if you'd like. You can fill in the blanks, save those for later for some devotion time, whatever you'd like to do to help your growth in Christ, you go ahead and do that. After teaching about uh, leadership, kingdom leadership, telling us what that was all about, Jesus leaves Galilee, finishes his ministry there, and he's headed toward Jerusalem. He's headed toward Jerusalem to die. He's told his disciples about this, and he actually embellishes it a bit here, tells them that he's going to die on a cross. Well, they're still worried about their position in his coming kingdom, and so they're still arguing about that. And so Jesus takes this opportunity on the way to Jerusalem, coming through Jericho, to, to heal uh, a couple of men so that he can teach them a little bit more about servant leadership. Summarizing his teaching on that, Matthew 20, 26 says, Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, leadership in the kingdom of heaven is not about raising yourself up, it's about laying yourself down. It's about emulating the humility and the compassion of Jesus so that you might influence people to be drawn to him. We're going to see an example of how Jesus led people into his kingdom. And hopefully, as we look at this story of these two blind men, you will see portrayed before you the understanding of servant leadership and then apply that to your life. The geographical context here in Matthew chapter 20 is the city of Jericho. It's located on the northern end of the Dead Sea. It's about 14 miles from Jerusalem. And as you look at that position in verse 29, you will see what we see as a controversial interruption. And as they were going out from Jericho, a great multitude followed him, and behold, two blind men sitting by the road hearing that Jesus was coming. Now it doesn't look like that's controversial if you just read that in and of itself. That verse though is because skeptics take it, they line it up to the other synoptic gospels, they see some differences in some of the details of the story, and so they tell you that the Bible contradicts itself and cannot be trusted. And that is true. If we compare this story in Mark and Luke, we see that they aren't quite the same. Mark's account only mentions one blind man. He gives us his name, and he actually tells us what his father's name is. He describes the scene like this. And they came to Jericho, and as he was going out from Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. Now Luke However, has Jesus heading in the opposite direction? He only mentions one blind man, and he doesn't tell us anything about his family. If you look at Luke 18, 35, it says, And he came about that as he was approaching Jericho, a certain blind man was sitting by the road begging. So why are there different specifics written in each gospel? Were there two men or was there only one man? Was Jesus going out from Jericho or was he approaching Jericho? And most importantly, should we question God's word because there are differences in the accounts? Well, you'll, you'll see that sometimes as you read the Synoptic Gospels. You'll see as they follow one another in these stories of Christ, having been there with him when it happened, most of them, you will see that there are certain details that may be different in different passages. If you get to one of those, don't look at that as contradictory. It's just a little controversial. So slow down, step away from it just a moment, 
and pray. Pray that God would speak to you through his word and then begin to dig in a little bit. You see, if you will broaden your context, if you will look at the writer's perspective when he was writing it, and if you will look at all of the factors that surround the passage that you're studying, then you will see that the Bible never contradicts itself. All three of these synoptic gospels agree that Jesus was coming from Galilee, he crossed over the Jordan River, and he came through Jericho. But if you'll look at that, you will see that Luke says he was approaching Jericho, and Matthew and Mark say that he was leaving Jericho. So to understand it, let's look at the details in the day that the text was written. First of all, what do we know about Jericho? Well, if you've been in church for any length of time, or you've been in a Sunday school class, you will know that Jericho was the city that Joshua and the children of Israel first came to when they crossed the Jordan River out of the wilderness into the Promised Land. Well, Jericho was a very large walled city, and it was impossible for them to breach those walls, and so they had a problem. They couldn't go further into the Promised Land without something happening to Jericho, but God had a plan. And you know the plan. It's kind of fun, isn't it? He told them to march around the city every day for seven days. And then he says on the seventh day, you're supposed to march around seven times, but on that seventh time, have the priests blow the trumpets, and all of the people are going to give a loud shout. And when you do that, the walls will come tumbling down, and it did. Well, if you read a little further in Joshua, get to the sixth chapter, the 26th verse, you will notice that the people took an oath not to rebuild the city of Jericho. As a matter of fact, there was even a curse attached to the oath. And so Israel kept that promise. They left the ruined city alone, but they did build a new Jericho not far from that original site. So one very plausible explanation on the differences of direction is simply a matter of the author's point of view. You see, Luke was writing from the perspective of the ancient city of Joshua's day, which was a place of ruins. It was a place where outcasts went especially a place where blind men went because there were some certain uh, uh, plants there that were said to be medicinal and they would use those plants to apply it to their eyes to get some comfort. So that was a very normal place for outcasts to be. Whereas uh, Mark and, and Matthew tell the story from the perspective, perspective of the new city in Jesus' day. So you could be going out of one Jericho and approaching the other and not contradict the biblical accounts. Well, what about the number of the blind men? Well, there's a, a very simple explanation when you know the history of the Scripture, of what happened closely following the writing of the Scriptures. Matthew, Mark only highlight one particular person, and that's uh, Bartimaeus. They were recording events brought to their memory under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit many years after the actual event took place. And it's very possible that by the time Mark and Luke wrote their Gospels, Bartimaeus had become a very prominent member in the early church. So it makes sense for them to put more personal attention toward Bartimaeus than the other man. And his testimony began with this encounter with Jesus. It's kind of like them saying, Jesus encountered two blind men in Jericho, and one of them was none other than our beloved brother Bartimaeus. So, Critics sometimes try to stir up controversy with these things, but if you'll do deeper study within the Word of God, it will always bring you to greater confidence in what God's Word is saying, because the Bible is the God-breathed, inerrant Word of God, and it never contradicts itself. So as Jesus is passing through Jericho, he is once again interrupted. And once again, our Lord is going to take the time to selflessly serve some people that were in a really great need. It's interesting that he does this because you remember he's on his way to Jericho. And basically this is going to be his hour. He is going to be crucified when he gets there. But with all of that on his mind, with all those thoughts, all those feelings in his heart, I'm sure he still was concerned about the least of these. So the second point is we see a desperate situation. Look at verse 30 of Matthew 20. It says, And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. 
Now today, modern medicine uh, can treat many different causes of blindness. And for those that can't be healed, there are a lot of technologies that we have today that can actually give blind people a very normal, uh, productive lifestyle. But that's not the way it was in Jesus' day. Dr. Warren Wiersbe writes, In that day, blindness was a common affliction for which there was no cure. And all a blind person could do was beg. So the blind men here were the dejected and the discarded of society. Their blindness was often caused by an infection or maybe a disease that often would cause redness and puffiness and swelling and oozing of the eyes. And so people didn't want to be around them. They would put them off. They would cast them aside. They were even afraid to touch them. These two men were thousands of throwaway people who through no fault of their own were just left to struggle and survive the best that they could. They were robbed of the ability to lead a normal life and their whole existence was just sitting next to this road hoping that maybe a stranger would come by and have a little bit of compassion and give them some money so that they might continue to live the next day. But what's noteworthy about their story and why we're talking about it today and why it's recorded in these three Gospels is the fact that these men knew what they needed. Not only did they know what they needed, but they also knew that they couldn't meet their need in and of themselves. Not only that, but they were bold enough to cry out to the one who could meet their need, who could heal them, who could save them, and he came near. So when he came near... Well, they weren't going to let the moment pass, amen? So look at what Luke says. And they told them him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by after he asked them who, what the commotion was all about. And immediately the scripture says, they cried out saying, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Now, the Greek word for cried out is the word krazo. It literally means to scream in anguish. And it is the exact same word used to describe the cries of a woman during childbirth. Pre-epidural, right? Any of you remember those days? Okay. Praise God for technological advances. Amen. At any rate, the point is they cried out in anguish. It was a loud cry. And they called Jesus the son of David, which showed that they knew him to be something very special, possibly the promised Messiah. Yet how did these blind men know who Jesus was? Well, if you go over to the Gospel of John, he does not record this particular story, but he gives us a lot of events and a lot of ideas, a lot of uh, teaching on Jesus that could be very relevant to us in knowing why these blind men referred to Jesus as son of David or Messiah. John tells us that not long before Jesus was in Jericho, he made this short trip to Bethany. Now, Bethany is a town that's pretty close to Jerusalem. It's kind of almost all the way up a hill, but it's situated right there in between Jericho and Jerusalem. In Bethany are three people. They are friends of Jesus. They probably supported his ministry. Their names are Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. If you remember that name, you'll remember that Lazarus died, and Jesus comes to Bethany and heals Lazarus. In other words, he resurrects him from the dead. He brings him out of the grave. Well, when that happened, that story caught on like wildfire. I mean, that news is going to travel, right? And the Bible says that there were many Jews in Bethany when that happened, and they just couldn't wait to get to Jerusalem to tell the chief priests and the Pharisees what Jesus had done, which scared the Pharisees and the chief priests to death. So they decided they were going to kill Jesus and Lazarus. I just thought when I said that in first service, that'd be a great deal, wouldn't it? You died, you got resurrected, and then somebody killed you again. That, that would be the, the height of bad luck, right? At any rate, as Jesus approaches Jericho, he, he realizes uh, that there are a lot of people that are following him out of the wilderness. Well, why did he come out of the wilderness? He came out of the wilderness back into Jericho because there was another man that had an appointment with Jesus, and his name was Zacchaeus. So Jesus is coming into Jericho to talk about Zacchaeus. These two blind men see him pass by, right? 
And so when they see him pass by, they cry out to him. After all, if Jesus resurrected a dead man, what's healing a couple of blind men? So here he comes through the old city. The two blind men come out. They, they hear about this. They're absolutely convinced that Jesus was the one who said he was the one that came from God. He, he alone could give them sight. And so they were going to get to Jesus. And I want to make a correlation here to us today. I think sometimes we as Americans and American Christians are very apathetic when it comes to Jesus. I mean, think about it. We have life so good that sometimes we just don't sense our need for Jesus, our deep spiritual need for Jesus. We don't cry cry out to him like they cried out to him. And I hope that the Spirit of God will begin to speak in your heart today, and I hope that he will speak to the very deep need in your heart and life for him. And that if there is something in your life that's keeping you from being the person that God wants you to be, that like these blind men, you will get, let nothing come in your way from getting to Christ. That you will do what God is calling you to do. If you look at the story of, of Paul in the scriptures, he tells his testimony a couple of times. He was Saul before he was Paul, and he persecuted the church. In Acts 22, he tells his story. And basically, what had happened was, he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church. Jesus appears to him in a bright light. He's blinded, knocked off his horse. His friends take him to a house in Damascus, a man by the name of Judas. And I think he's sitting in this room, repenting, just feeling the weight of what he had been doing. When God comes to the prophet Ananias, tells him to go to Saul, he goes to Saul, he comes into his room, he sees Saul there, and Ananias says this, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And maybe God is saying to you, what are you waiting for? Get up, jump up. These two men realized their desperate situation, and so number three, they made a persistent exclamation. In Matthew 20, 31, the scripture says, and the multitude sternly told them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more, saying, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. We've heard that a few times, right? When the blind men cried out, rather than compassionately helping them get to Jesus, what does the multitude do? They callously tell them, shut up. You're disturbing everybody. Just sit there and shut up. You're blind men. You can't do anything. Just be quiet. And who has the sight problem? If Jesus is in us, then we are to love people the way he does. And if we do not love the least of these as Jesus does with kindness and intimacy and care, then I say the love of Christ is is not in you. You see, love isn't about excitement. Love is about doing what's right. So in any relationship, do what's right. And that's love. In spite of the resistance around them, though, these two men were persistent. They wouldn't shut up. They find their way to a miracle. When their chance came, they seized it with all of their might. If they had let Jesus pass, you see, their chance would have been gone forever. And they didn't want to take that chance. Now listen, after many years of ministry, I have one thing that is just the saddest thing that I see in people's lives. And that very sad thing is people with no persistence when it comes to the things of God. No persistence to seek God, to do what he calls us to do. We have such a lackadaisical, apathetic view toward God so many times in our lives, especially when it comes to salvation. Rather than cry out to Jesus when it's clear that he has set a divine appointment in our lives for too many people, they are distracted by the world and they let those moments pass them by. I knew a young man by the name of Terry when I was in my ministry in southwest Kansas. His family attended the church that I ministered to, and she prayed for Terry every day that he would become a Christian. Finally, after a lot of persistence, she talked Terry into 
uh, meeting with me. I was the minister of evangelism at the time. And at that time, I was doing this uh, evangelism thing where I would meet with people for uh, four sessions. And I would do that over a period of four weeks. Once a week, one hour, four times. And I did that with Terry. Needless to say, I tried to go through every aspect of the gospel. Who is Jesus? What did he do? Who is God? What is sin? What is grace? What is faith? All of those things I taught him and I taught him and I taught him. And finally, when the last visitation came and I finished what I was going to say, I looked at Terry and I said, do you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? And he looked at me and he said, no. And I was a little bit shocked by that. And I said, Terry, you understand about hell and heaven and all of the aspects of salvation. He said, yes. And then he said this. He said, but I just have so many things in my life that I don't want to give up. See, he understood that a part of the salvation process is repentance. It's making Jesus Lord. It's dying to yourself. It's leaving the old creature and becoming a new creature. And he just wasn't ready to do it. So I left. The next week, Terry's wife called me. She said, Jack, meet me at the hospital. Terry has passed out in the shower and we've taken him to the hospital. So I got in my car and I drove down to the hospital and I stopped at the front desk. They said that he was in ICU. So as I was walking down the long hallway of that hospital toward ICU, his 12-year-old daughter came running from the opposite direction down that hallway right to me, crying and screaming out with that crazo kind of scream. She was saying, my daddy's dead. Jack, my daddy's dead. Now, I tell you that I trust God in his wisdom and his understanding. But as far as I know, Terry died without Jesus. As far as I know, he rejected Christ. And that, that haunts me. I mean, as I'm telling you this story, I'm thinking, could I have done more? Could I have said more? Could I have been more persistent? Could I have spoken more clearly or more passionately? But then my next question is, what will it take to convince people who don't know Christ to leave the old dead life and be resurrected into a newness of life. Because you see, when that moment comes, if it passes, sometimes the impulse that was there initially fades away. In Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul now is standing on Mars Hill. He's preaching to what the Bible calls the men of Athens. And he tells them about God and he tells them about faith. He tells them that God wants them to repent. And then he convinces them of who Jesus was by telling them about the resurrection. And when he finished saying all of that to them, they responded with these words. We will hear you again concerning this. In other words, they let their moment pass because Paul left Greece because of unresponsiveness. And as far as we know, Perhaps they never got that chance again. The blind men in Matthew 20 would not be discouraged. They would not let their moment pass because they knew their need and nothing was going to stop them. They realized that they had nothing to lose. They had everything to gain. It wasn't about being embarrassed. It was about being healed. And the choice was sight or blindness, darkness or light, death or life. And so these two men chose life. Number four, we see a faith-filled expectation. Verses 32 and 33 says, And Jesus stopped and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened. Now, do you remember a couple of weeks ago when James and John came with their mother and Jesus wanted to know what they wanted, and the mother said, I want my sons to sit on your right hand and your left hand when you come into your kingdom. The difference between that question of Jesus and the question, the answer of the blind men is the difference between ambition and faith. 
These two men didn't hesitate for a moment. They knew Jesus had the answer to their desperate situation. And once they asked what they wanted, they clearly stated that they wanted to see again. You know, sometimes we don't do what we know we should do when it comes to those times of falling on our face before Jesus and telling him that we will surrender to him what he is asking us to surrender. Sometimes what we do instead is we place our wants or our perceived needs above what God wants for our life. God wants to give you spiritual sight. God wants to give you forgiveness of sin. God wants to give you a hope of eternal life and the Spirit of God, divine Spirit, to come inside you, to enable you, to empower you, to enlighten you, to strengthen you, to encourage you, to convict you. He wants to give you the hope of eternal life. And yet, so many times, we don't receive that spiritual sight because we're not willing to give up the things of this world. There's just some more things that I need to do, God. Maybe tomorrow. You know, Jesus often called attention to seekers who had faith-filled expectations. Sometimes he would say to them, your faith has made you whole or your faith has healed you. Faith expects a positive outcome because faith knows that with God, all things are possible. Friends, let me encourage you right now to stir up a little faith-filled expectations in your heart. Proverbs 24, 14 says, your hope shall not be cut off. To live in expectation means to have intense anticipation for the thing desired. Do you intensely anticipate having that relationship with Christ and reigning forever with Him? Faith is a reaching out in readiness to receive something. These blind men put this into practice as they approached Jesus with a strong, faith-filled expectation. Notice that they completely believed and trusted Jesus would give them what they asked for. In fact, as soon as Jesus called them, Mark says that Bartimaeus cast aside his cloak, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Now I want you to see something here. This cloak was something very unique to blind men. This cloak was examined by the authorities of the day, and if the authorities found that these blind men could not make a living any other way, then the cloak was a sign that they were blind and they had the right to beg to receive money. Not only that, but the cloak was what he would lay on the ground and sit on and lay his alms basket waiting for someone to come by and giving a pittance of something. His cloak was the thing that he wrapped around him to keep him warm in the winter. His cloak was the only thing he had. And what does he do with it? He casts it aside and he jumps up and he runs to Jesus. I am telling you, that what this man was doing was he was believing in his heart that God was going to heal him before he did. He had faith to believe that he was casting aside that old life for a new one. He didn't need it anymore. He was going to be whole. In their book, Starting Over, Life Beyond Your Regrets, Dave and John Ferguson write, Trust isn't a dull sort of idleness. We don't just sit around hoping something will happen. Like, I hope I get a nice gift for Christmas. Nor is it a self-generated hope against hope. That depends on our working up our emotions inside ourselves. Instead, it's an eager expectation and a peaceful confidence that God will act in His own way in His own time. It is based on what we know of God's character and how he has consistently acted in the past. So what's your need today? What do you really want today? As servant leaders, we should want what Jesus wants for us. Amen? We would not come to him and tell him what he's supposed to do for us. That's not faith-filled expectation at all. That's not the right mindset at all. We are encouraged to keep knocking, to keep asking, to keep seeking, to keep expecting that God is able. 
and willing to give us what we want and what we need in Jesus' name. Like Bartimaeus, we must cast aside all of the things that distract us, jump up and run to Jesus. These men in faith told Jesus exactly what they wanted. And in verse 34 it says, And moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes, and immediately they regained their sight. I call you back to the beginning of the sermon when I was explaining to you blindness in the first century. Do you remember? Sometimes they would have oozing eyes, redness, puffy eyes. Sometimes it was very visible that they had an infection or a disease, and so they were cast-offs. They were throwaways. Nobody wanted to be around them, and God forbid if they ever had to touch them. Now, I tell you that Jesus could have healed them by just speaking healing into their life, like he did Lazarus, a dead man. I mean, come on. He stands on the outside of the grave and says, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus hops out of the grave. Yes, he hopped. He had grave clothes wrapped all around him. He hopped. Jesus said, take his grave clothes off. Right? Get rid of the cloak. Get rid of the grave clothes. Get rid of the old life. Get rid of that. Free him. He now has life. And so what Jesus does with these blind men is he looks beyond the need of blindness, which was obvious, and in his compassion, in his empathy, in his love, he touched the untouchable. He loved the unlovely. And I say to you that he met a deeper need in their lives than the need of blindness. He met an emotional need. He met a deep need in these men's lives. And when they looked at him, suddenly he was their deliverer. And so they started to glorify God. And now watch how this affects the crowd. Because what does the crowd start doing? Why well, they start giving praise to God. What a scene. Having gained everything, these two men attach themselves to their deliverer. They are beggars no longer. They're believers. They are followers. They are disciples. Because when they finally could see, I imagine, they had to focus through tear-filled eyes. And they focused it on the one who gave them sight. And I suppose that if you will look and if you will truly see Jesus, and if he truly touches you and changes you and heal you, that you will probably look through tear-filled eyes, and you will see him, and you will give him glory, and you will follow him. That is who Jesus is, and that's what he calls us to, and that is servant leadership. So today, reach out to him. And I would say to you, no matter what your desperate circumstances, and I know that there are people here who have some really desperate circumstances, and you need to give those things to him and trust him with faith-filled expectation that when he touches you and when you can see that you will be able to leave this place giving him glory, following him, and leading others to meet the one who changed you, who saved you, who healed you, who gave you sight, who gave you hope, and who never will let you down. Listen, if Jesus had compassion on these beggars, and if he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, why would he not give you compassion today? Why would he not meet your deepest need if you'll just give it up and trust him to give you something better father thank you so much for today thank you so much that we could come into this place together and that we could worship today and that we could focus our attention on you this story of Bartimaeus and his friend are really more about Jesus and their Lord it's about the one who totally changes multitudes in a moment the compassion and love of our savior is unspeakable it's almost unbelievable but i am so glad that it's not 
something that we cannot experience. For we have felt your touch, Lord. We know your love and we know your compassion. And I pray today that if there is one that doesn't, that the day would be the day that they let nothing keep them back. That they come to you in faith and full assurance. In Jesus' name, amen.